George Tenet, director of the CIA, urgently requested to see you at the White House, and he said to you at the White House, quote, there will be a significant terrorist attack in weeks or months. Uh, not exactly. <laughs> uh, what he said, we, we did meet, as a matter of fact. He called me, and it was fairly late. It was probably 7 or 7.30. I said, George, come right over, and he did. Um, and they were reading, and I was reading, we were all reading, the chatter. Um, mm -hmm. And when terrorists are chattering, they th say things like, something big will happen. Right? That's the character of the chatter. And um, he said, I'm worried. And we went through a list of where possible attacks could be. The United States of America was not on that list. And I want to be very clear about that, because the idea, and, and George himself has never said he warned of a homeland attack. We thought that, that uh, Genoa was in danger because the G8 was going to meet there. And so we put up caps around Genoa. We thought Jordan was in danger. We thought Saudi Arabia was in danger. Those were the places that it looked like there might be something. Uh, a few days later, I, just out of the blue, I said to Andy Card, uh, because National Security Advisor at that time had no uh, jurisdiction over homeland, we thought of attacks as external. So I said, you know, we better maybe just get the domestic agencies together just in case. So we got the FBI in the room and some others, and we said, are you, you know, we don't know, there's nothing that says. There was uh, a few weeks later something that says Osama bin Laden uh, wants to attack the United States. Well, I could have told you that without an intelligence report. <laughs> so, what we missed and what the intelligence agencies missed were things that they couldn't see because of the structure of our intelligence gathering. The FBI dealt with internal affairs. The CIA dealt with external affairs. Because of civil liberties issues, we didn't want them to link up. And so the pieces of information that might have helped us know what was, coming, what was coming were in separate parts of the government. And that was the reorganization that changed the way that we created um, intelligence reporting for the president. And I'll tell you that for the first couple days after 9-11, we just did it through brute force. We had the uh, director of FBI and the director of uh, the CIA in the Oval Office with the president going through every threat because we still had no way to hook up the FBI and the CIA. Do you, do you regret saying that it was based on old reporting in reference to the August 6, 2001 presidential brief titled that bin Laden determined to strike right. the U.S.? Like I said, I could have told you that, and mm -hmm. it was old reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, not only was old reporting, it was a bunch of newspaper clippings. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, mm -hmm. that particular report, there were a couple of things in there that we checked out. Uh, it said they might uh, use aircraft. They meant hijack them the old-fashioned way. We were just deaf and blind but it, on 9-11. That's the, the truth. At the same time, Ma, did Richard Clark, senior White House counterism official, write to you on September 4, 2001, quote, which he claims, he, quote, urge you to imagine a day after a terrorist attack with hundreds of Americans dead at home and asked themselves what they could have done earlier. And what was I supposed to do right. with that? Right. Uh, yes, I could imagine that day. And I had, we, uh, the reason Richard wrote that was that we were actually in the process, under Richard's direction, of trying to come up with a, a strategy to actually destroy Al Qaeda. We felt that the Clinton administration had, you know, they'd done some strikes against tra training camps and the like, but we didn't have a strategy to really destroy Al Qaeda. And uh, we had had a national security meeting, and of course the Pentagon and the CIA were at each other about who was going to control what, and I think Richard's frustration was, we got to get somewhere with this. I couldn't have agreed more. And in fact, on September 10th, we delivered a report to the President of the United States on his desk that says, here's the strategy for destroying Al-Qaeda. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's not as if nobody was paying attention. And oh, by the way, a few days after 9-11, Richard Clark, uh, delivered a memo that he seems to have forgotten, which said, um, if anybody asks, we did everything we could to mm -hmm. avoid this attack. And the sad thing is, you know, if you're in a position of authority on those days, you always wonder, could I have done more? By definition, we should have done more. But we didn't have the means to know what to do. And we have, by the way, now deprived ourselves mm -hmm. of some of those means. The reason that the NSA program was put in place, the now 
uh, the program that's been banned now because the courts have said that bulk data collection is unconstitutional, um, was to be able to find that needle in a haystack. Okay, so you want to catch terrorists before they commit their crime, not after. And so you are looking for connections. So the way that the, the program worked was, let's say I find in Afghanistan a phone number on a dead terrorist. I would take that number and ping it against all possible numbers. And then, if it connected, I would go and get a warrant to surveil that number. So the idea that the NSA was out there routinely listening to American conversations with their grandmother was just not true. And I say to people, you know, bulk data is all around you. Uh, metadata and, uh, you know, big data analysis. So if I buy golf balls, it won't be long before something pops up that says, you might want golf clubs too. <coughs> and then a few minutes later, it will say, have you been on a golf vacation lately? <laughs> right? That's a big data algorithm that's making associations. That's what the NSA program was. 